Well, good evening to all of you out there. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, as I was saying a little earlier to the uh, distinguished speaker and special invitee out here, this is a presentation that I am looking forward to myself for the sheer potential that it offers for the next 10, maybe 20 years for the world and in particular for India. It becomes a lot more significant, especially because this is a proven and demonstrated practice in Singapore and China. Singapore is too small, it's 5 million people and 700 square kilometers, so no one would want to take that as seriously as the dramatic impact that it has made in China. We bring you the second edition of the iconic India Innovations Dialogue that the Prem J Memorial Trust is happy to present every alternate Thursday. It's heartening for us to know that the Living Building series has brought some change in the formative minds of young architects over the eight presentations that we have so far had in Series 1 and Series 2, this being the eighth. Many of you student architects and engineers have learned tangible elements of how a living building performs and what a living building needs with uh, all that's been presented so far. The last time that we had a presentation was the brilliant one from Sanjeev Karpe two Thursdays ago. The reference reading for this session is available at a link that will appear in the chat box anytime now. Please watch the chat box for what we will want to inform you of while you will present things that you want to ask us or comment upon in the Q&A window. This makes it easy for me to track. So please remember that. Q&A for you, chat for us. Today's presentation has three sessions. I will first present or share a picture of the dire necessity for this shift in the way we look at reuse and recycle of water. The theme today, as you know, is should fresh water be used just once? Of the three big engineering challenges of this century, water ranks perhaps the first. Grid-free energy is the second. You know that there has been work going on on hydrogen and how you can split water uh, from uh, from oxygen into, into, uh, into, from a molecule into what can become an atom that can be explosive as energy. Transport or mobility is the third such engineering challenge before all of us in the next three, three decades or so. After I share with you notes on the very basic mental engineering, I call it, that we all need to do as water users in cities, I will request Jaya Dinda of the World Resources Institute who also spearheads the City Fix program to nurture green leaders. Thank you, Jaya, for being with us today and sparing time. She will share her thoughts on the unique viability and dependability of the technology-based solutions that Vikas is presenting today. The third session will be the longer one because Brahmavar will show you the projects that he has specifically installed very successfully with proven readings of the high hygiene, health grade water treatment systems that he has delivered in the last about two and a half, three years. He will tell you his story of what inspired him to see the potential for such wastewater to freshwater solutions well ahead of its time. He will also share his experience on the marketplace of the Himalayan block in mental acceptance of water users. That's a story that you all have to listen to very important, particularly for the younger generation of architects and engineers who are here today. Some housekeeping needs, as I told you, and I'll remind you again, q and is for you to send in notes and comments and observations and perhaps questions that you want to ask of us. While on the chat box, you will see, you know, every, every few minutes, something or the other that comes in as detailed notes about the trust, about this presentation, about the profiles of these panelists and so on. Uh, there will be a last session, of course, after Vikas completes, uh, called the Q&AR, about 30 minutes or so. Allow me to start the first session. I'll take about eight to 10 minutes, and I have some very significant things to offer to all of you students. Carl Jung was a thinker of the last century, a very rational mind, 
but he wrote off a somewhat unquantifiable thing called synchronicity. Even having a coincidence in time of how creating a feeling that a deeper motivation or need is involved in certain times. In times such as this, post-COVID particularly, it becomes a circumstance that makes it appealing, attractive, even compelling. It's a coincidence that teases us that the post-COVID lockdown has stopped us in our tracks and made us relook at how we will reboot everything we do and not just our economy. That is part of such synchronicity. In times such as this, I reflect on the simple wisdom of a Dr. Prem Jain, who said in his very, very wonderful, cheerful ways, if we can change the way you think about building or constructing, maybe what you build will change the world. You must look at the website again and look at some of the reflections that he offered, many reflections. You must read a book that is presented uh, at the website of his uh, reflections, shall we say, as I said earlier. Uh, he was resonating, Dr. Jane was resonating with what some of the finest thinkers of the last century have wondered about. From J.C. Kumarappa, who worked with Gandhi in the 1930s and 1940s, to Alvin Toffler and Schumacher, who were influenced by such localized solutions and options for sustaining lives. There were many who offered the vision and many hundreds of green solution providers who offered solutions that fulfilled that vision because is one of them. Every city has stretched its limits on sources of water from rivers or lakes last built and nurtured about a century ago. Those urban planners of the past who rooted for supply side solutions are at a complete loss and find themselves professionally irrelevant. No more than two liters to a person is used for drinking daily with another five liters per person for cooking at a general estimate. You know that. Yet we use so much fresh water for all the rest of our daily needs that do not need high hygiene, high cost water. As someone said graphically, this is like using your new BMW to take chickens from a farm to the marketplace. You must listen to this person called Jorg, J-O-R-G on the YouTube talking about fresh water from wastewater. In what you will know as the rich and swank Dubai or Sharjah, people are used to getting brackish, semi-treated, salty, tasting water, although it is a desalinated uh, system of providing water for the city. In Abu Dhabi, it is the same too. People even brush their teeth with it, apart from bathing. Now you know why you should not covet a job in Dubai. People living there will tell you of how taking a shower with the brackish bathwater can have you permanently lose hair with irreparable damage to your scalp. Countries around the Balkans, like Latvia and Lithuania, have similar water challenges. India offers the rare privilege of fresh water for every need at one-tenth the cost that you pay in other countries. Hong Kong is dependent on mainland China for fresh water, while Singapore holds its breath every time Malaysia raises the threat of cutting water supply. You must read reports of those kinds if you do actually want to understand this rare privilege that you and I have of plentiful water in a relative sense of the word. Users pay three times what we pay in nearly every city in India, out there in those countries and cities. And users think it's their birthright in India to have government supply fresh water. I can tell you from first-hand experience how in Aurangabad, this must have happened about 12 years ago, water consumers have made it a habit to get out Jal Nigam officials when water is not supplied. So what can a water supply board official do if there is no water in the river, which is the source? Should users not ask themselves what they can do to solve the challenge without using up precious and depleting groundwater resources with that terrible thing called the bore well? Well, people are still not provoked or driven or pushed to look at solutions that China has adopted or Singapore was forced to adopt out of sheer need in the last 10, 12 years. I think it started in 2008 or so. In India, we continue to abuse our privilege. And the ones who enjoy all of India's privileges appear to want the smog of a Pittsburgh in the US or a Beijing or a Shanghai. Uchala Jaludi Ranga wrote Gurudev Tagore in 1911 in a song of five stanzas 
that we know as our national anthem. Most of us don't know the other four. I would recommend you to read them and understand the nuance of what he spoke about of the plentiful bounties that India offered. And that was in 1911. Until 1970, India was a land of plenty. People lived off large lakes close to their cities like Bhopal or Chennai or Surat. Maharaja Sahaji Rao of Baroda built intricate water supply systems that respected the river Vishwamitri and drew what was needed for her people from that river. That was in the 1880s or so that he first designed that system. In the 1970s, we rapidly enlarged our footprint of long distance sourcing. In the 1980s, we brought the horror of bore wells. And in 40 years since then, we brought water levels to 1,500 or 2,000 feet in certain parts of Bangalore and in many other cities. We made even cities like Bangalore into deserts. Surat once considered a city of lakes like Bhopal as many of those lakes dead. From the rash things that you love to spend your evenings at, they're called malls and theaters, as you know, to anonymous office spaces where thousands work in air-conditioned comfort, have you asked what it takes to keep the temperature controlled? Water engineers like Vikas go behind, beyond those pretty buildings with luxury facades to look at the ugly side of their operations the noisy hum of the chiller plants, if you go to any such building, and the quantum of fresh water they demand daily to keep those large spaces cooled is part of our professional concern. How can we reduce the massive quantities of fresh water that these chiller plants demand? These experts ask. And they find solutions with infinite cycles of treating and retreating water because we'll present more of this as when he uh, gets on to speaking. Such water experts go into challenges of the salts that use water carry or groundwater brought by tankers carry. We still have engineers in building projects, dig new bore wells at enormous cost without understanding the nature of solutions that are already available. People like Vikas will tell you of the severe challenges of hardness of water, of how tedious or total dissolved solids can cause rapid damage with what's called scaling to those pipes that transport water inside a building. There are engineer experts like Srinath, who we will invite another day to the Living Building series of chats, who speak of solutions to scaling. We fail to understand, all of us, how water responds to rain and to the heat of summer or the cold of winter. Even as I speak, Bangalore has had a long spell of rain this afternoon. And I know that the nature of water will change as Vikas will tell you. Those dissolved solids are about minerals, salts, metals, cations, anions dissolved in water. You can read about all these things on the website. I don't need to tell you of, of any of these nuances. These comprise essentially inorganic salts, principally things like calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, bicarbonates, chlorides, there are 39 such water quality parameters as he will show you. The delicate balance of your body and of the elements in earth is forgotten easily. There are 68 minerals that course through our blood and our veins. We have to understand this immense and complicated connect that, that is beyond our comprehension with earth. Today's speaker will tell you more of the marvels of nature that alter the nature of water with seasons that pass and the solutions that human genome research has enabled in just the last 12 to 14 years, after 100 years, probably 120 years, of being used to this uh, system of centralized water supply. These water experts and many other such water innovators look at apartments that depend 50 to 70% on tankers for their fresh water and know there are solutions. And before you uh, to start to oppose what I'm saying, I can tell you that this is the truth in many, many suburbs of Bangalore, where there is simply no supply of municipal water. They know that consumers will someday soon change. These experts know that consumers will someday soon change to these high hygiene water systems that give them pure water that is far superior to river water or to bore well water. They know the source of your water, bore wells or tankers, which depend on bore wells uh, uh, elsewhere in your local area, or the polluted rivers which offer municipal water is not your solution to fresh, high hygiene drinking water that you need. 
certainly not into the future before us. As young architects, I'd like you to see that you go beyond the envelope to understand what this means before you interpret and offer solutions to your clients or to the end customers. Experts know that every building, your apartment and office too, in the city is highly water stressed. Yet as consumers, we bury our nicks in the sand and allow governments to spend precious taxpayers' money on massive long distance projects for bringing water from rivers that are not pristine, that are not clean, that are so polluted, that it's better to treat wastewater from your own backyard at your apartment or your office. But no, we will still live with the lie. UP government has spent 300 crore plus over the last two, two and a half, maybe no, about four years to get 200 million liters a day of water from the Ganga. It will soon be commissioned this year. It was scheduled for June or July, but thanks to COVID, this has been delayed a bit. But from the Ganga, with corpses of cattle and humans floating in the river, does it not make more sense for you to treat water under your direct supervision, right at your building, from wastewater generated by your own building, without the risk of chemical contamination, and only 1% organic matter in such wastewater that needs to be treated before you drink it again. My hope is that people who work in the HVAC industry and many of those leaders I'm hoping have uh, joined this session because we particularly wanted people from Israel and Ashray to also be present because these are leaders who can influence such decisions even if they can't make the decisions themselves for their clients. They will, I am hoping, learn from the startling insights that this presentation offers. There is much to learn and to offer as solutions to buildings across the country for these air conditioning experts who create the problem first with inefficient water intense central AC systems. Temperate cities like Bangalore, for example, which enjoy excellent weather all through the year, barring the six week early summer that we have in March. You must all know that I come from Bangalore. We have here 800 to 1,000 million TR or tons of refrigeration that consume 40 crore to 50 crore liters of fresh water every day. That's approximately one third of what humans in Bangalore demand. You and I as citizens demand about 130 crore liters in Bangalore. Those chiller plants need water as pure as what as water humans drink. It is such destructive design that has contributed largely to the ecological damage in the last 20 years, from about 1995 or so, with the indiscriminate use of ACs that has fed greed in the marketplace beyond need in nearly every case. Pune is another city, or a celebrated Gopal, for instance, that can do well without air conditioners. Bangalore has near, and that is something that the Indian Green Building Council is also seeking to address as it goes along, but it isn't always in the hands of such uh, uh, governing uh, agencies or people who want to bring in monitoring standards because the marketplace finally will dictate what is essential for them. So there is this difference between what they want and what the market needs. And that has been the, cha the, the, the challenge for people like me too for 30, 35 years. Bangalore has nearly, as I said, one and a half crore people with 130 crore liters of water needed. And it's set to reach two crore people by end of this decade. Where is the water? Will Bobels address this? Dear viewers, all of you students, you are the best judge. You will know how to shape the destiny of this precious liquid, without which there is no life for humans on Earth, or for all living species which suffer at our expense, at the cost of humans. It's, uh, it's time I handed over the mic actually to Jaya Dindo. You will have seen her profile on the chat box. So I'll skip introductions. Thank you, Jaya, actually, once again, for making time. You chose because to be one of the few green entrepreneurs that CityFix has mentored under the larger umbrella of the World Resources Institute. There can't be anyone more appropriate, therefore, to be a special guest and invitee at this session. It must be a moment of satisfaction for you, Jaya, and all of your officers at the World Resources Institute to see because enlarging successfully his footprint with the wastewater to freshwater solutions he has been advocating. Well, can I hand the mic over to you, Jaya? Thank you so much once again. Thank you so much, Hari. Uh, and thank you, first of all, to Premjen Memorial Trust. And Hari, to you for inviting me. 
Uh, like you said, it is indeed very satisfying and encouraging uh, to see one of our mentees uh, here on this platform and basically expanding and growing from strength to strength. Uh, so first, I'd just like to give a little bit of an introduction on who we are and what we do. Uh, so I am with an organization called the World Resources Institute. We are essentially a research organization uh, who look at the issues that exist between the domains of economic growth and environmental uh, planning and the nexus between the two. And we believe that both can be achieved without happening at the cost of the other. And so we are working through research and evidence base to transform policy uh, through capacity building, through on-ground interventions to help cities solve long-standing problems of lock-in, whether it is infrastructure or any kind of critical decisions they are making, and move the needle towards sustainability a little bit. Uh, so that's sort of an introduction of uh, you know, who I am and what we do. And I'll also speak subsequently about the City Fix Labs and how we uh, sort of uncovered Vikas uh, through this process. But first, I would like to start with, you know, why essentially innovation is important. Now, if you look at the 1500s, and because China is being talked about a lot, uh, China's economy was the strongest in the world. But by the 19th century and post-industrial revolution, the US, Western Europe, and Japan had leapfrogged over China while the former superpowers stalled. Uh, and when you look at the reasons why that happened, some economists argue that China's lack of free markets and unencumbered innovation in the West led to the shift. Now, examples of such innovation back then are modern chemistry, steam powered, applied to transportation, and so on and so forth. But not just technology, modern economic growth also came from organizational innovation. So places where people were free to experiment, to simultaneously compete and cooperate through a market where no one was in charge of deciding which technology would be adopted, who would be rejected, and what would be forbidden. China, meanwhile, took the opposite approach, and, and we know where they are, and you know there are lessons to learn. Now, we are at one such moment yet again, with 75% of India's 2050 urban infrastructure yet to be built, which means we are at a pivotal moment where we get to decide um, you know, how that infrastructure will be built, and how will that be serviced, and how will that be financed. And with more and more population urbanizing, uh, at one point, you know, more than 60% of the population will be urban and shrinking government coffers, which will be even more impacted by the recent pandemic. It's time for us to think innovatively again so we can build that whole vision that we planners have of compact, connected, and clean cities. Now, to give you a sense of the magnitude of the problem that exists in India, and, you know, Hari already mentioned it, but also because, you know, some of these numbers are important to know. They may not be perfectly accurate but they give you a sense of where we're at and they're important to consider. So 71% of groundwater in Bangalore, for example, is unfit for consumption. 66% of the lakes in Bangalore are sewage fed. And the reason I'm talking about Bangalore is because I too, like Hari, I'm from Bangalore uh, and I have you know, good data about uh, the situation here. Again, now about 25% of the people in the city of 1.2 million have no access to pipe water. There's excessive groundwater pumping, which is leading to subsidence, which means you know, the earth is settling uh, at an abnormal rate, and that leads to reduced recharge potential. Also, 70% of the wastewater is released untreated into water bodies. And the problem is not just that we don't want to do it, but also because the infrastructure to do it does not exist, and the city does not have, the way, have a way to pay for it. And all of this basically makes it so difficult that you know, a fifth of the communicable diseases in India are water related. And um, areas most stressed are those like Hari mentioned outside the municipal boundaries and the peripheries where currently there is the most growth that is happening and they're having to make do with self-provisioning through tankers and groundwater. Uh, not to mention that the growing demand that will be accelerated as industries try to compensate for the lockdowns and the closures that have happened and the water that is needed for manufacturing, cooling, including power plants, is huge. It's just unimaginable, the quantities that will be needed. Now, economic growth, environment, and health, therefore, are going to be underlined by equity uh, and will need to be top priorities as cities plan for resilient futures. Part of this means how do we manage and use our resources well. Now, WRI has a tool called Aqueduct, and through that we've measured that 50 4% of India is water stressed. And of course, there are other reports that corroborate this and suggest that many cities, about 20 or 21 of them, will run out, by, run out of water in the next year or two. 
Now, when we say run out of water, what do we actually mean? What this really means is that the poor and lower income will have reduced access to clean water and will spend more time, energy, and resources accessing it. This is a gargantuan issue that cities are grappling with, and the problems lie at various points of the water value, water access value chain. Now, to help address this is where we came in. Uh, WRI India ran an accelerator called the City Fix Labs. And accelerators are programs basically which identify innovative solutions and find ways to capacitate them and scale them so that they can benefit the larger community good. Now, at City Fix, we looked at identifying, capacitating, and also helping de risk innovative solutions because a lot of these solutions we thought were meant for government and that you know, they would be the ideal sort of customers for these solutions. And of course, you know, governments don't often take very high risks in the environment that we are in. And so the point was, you know, how do you de-risk these solutions, which have the potential for solving long-standing problems uh, in waste, water, and energy? These were the three areas we focused um, in. And ultimately, you know, how can they scale to aid efficiency in public service delivery? That was essentially our goal. Now, through this CityFix Labs, what we did was basically a challenge process. There were 125 applications. Boson, because is one of the top, top 10 companies whose solutions was selected by an external jury. Now, we evaluated the solutions on the basis of five major parameters, and these are important to note. First of all, the problem that's addressed, you know, does the solution address an urgent or a real problem? Second, what specific city need is being addressed by utilizing the solution? And is the innovation unique and demonstrable? So it's not an idea that someone has, but it's something that's been on the ground and you know, demonstrates a certain technical um, you know, stability. Second was potential financing and any hurdles in business models that are difficult to overcome because financing forms a key way in which solutions are able to scale or see the light of day or even work in partnership with other stakeholders. Uh, does the team have the skills and the resources to deliver the project? and a clear vision for what they want to do and how they want to do it. The vision is very important uh, and it was pivotal for us to decide you know, which solutions we would take up for the accelerator and which ones you know, would, would be left out. Um, scalability and replicability was next clearly because we were looking at government as the major customer. So whether it was across customer segments, whether it was from residential to business, from public to private or across cities, that was one of the important criteria. And then finally, impact. You know, does the solution have a clearly discernible socio-economic and environmental impact? And as part of this, we also look closely at what kind of unintended negative externalities these solutions could cause. Because for example, with RO, we know that to get one liter of clean uh, water, you know, there are 15 liters which are kind of wasted in the processing. So that's an unintended negative externalities. And we realized that some solutions may have it, but we wanted to hedge, you know, what kind of uh, unintended negative external externalities did all of these solutions present. Now, what we found was that when we gathered the 10 people in our cohort, uh, Vikas being one of them, we realized that there were five major problems, essentially, with all of these solutions, whether in waste, water, or energy. One was on the policy and regulatory side. On this, uh, regulatory side. So, for example, there are few policies and there's low implementation of conservation, reuse, and resource recovery practices, for example, in the water sector. Also, water use is not capped to reflect the limited nature of this resource and then skewed water pricing dis disincentivizes water conservation and efficiency measures. Um, so this is on the policy front. On the capacity front, there was no capacity uh, to conduct you know, hydrological studies, uh, supply zones, sustainable water management practices such as integrated urban water management. And frankly, in many cases, this wasn't even the mandate of the service delivery provider. The third was financial. Uh, so there are high capital and operations and maintenance costs, including energy costs associated with the water supply and treatment systems. And there are high costs to retrofitting to sustainable standards and how do you overcome that? Uh, the fourth was markets. Uh, water markets focus on demand side and you know, how do you look at uh, there's limited or you know, market for resource recovery um, and products that do drive behavioral change to improve water management. So how do you kind of integrate that as part of the solution? And finally, information. I mean, the main and the basic information is that there was no clarity on the true cost of water supply or on the climate costs of water supply due to high energy consumption, for example. So while you pay maybe a 10 rupees or a 20 rupees for a bisleri bottle outside, that is not the true cost of that water. 
and that awareness does not exist for the most part. Now, determining that these sectors, you know, suffered from a lack of access, sort of. The city fix lab structured itself to provide access and visibility uh, to governments, to markets, financing, so that sustainable, <clears throat> sorry, and visibility to the sustainable solutions in public service delivery. And that was kind of our objective. Now, the demand side water use efficiency model, which Boson had needed help with refining business model frameworks. As you know, Vikas will tell you later, it was taking a long time to close the loop on projects. They also wanted government connections and ways to scale because this is an important solution that could impact city level efficiencies in the sector. Now, what is still lacking uh, presently, and I'll just finish with that, is what is still lacking, and I'll hand, hand it over to Vikas. So what is lacking is still awareness and government support or norms for direct portable use of recycled water. And who has a role to play? Three stakeholders primarily, but essentially all of us. The first is the government. Uh, so first, you know, they need to create and enforce norms and help build awareness around the recycled water. The second is businesses, because they, big businesses especially, can be first movers and help evangelize the use of recycled water, which is something that's not happening right now. Everyone's waiting for someone else to do it before they can do it. And lastly, communities, us. So basically adapting to and trusting indigenous technology that, you know, it doesn't have to be um, a Bill and Melinda Gates, for example, operating in Africa or in India, but there can be indigenous technology which offers that kind of solution that, that, that's needed in city. So with that, I'll stop. And I'm really pleased to see Vikas doing his bit and mentors like Hari supporting this agenda. Um, I wish him very good luck and would like to leave you with a quote which you have heard before, but you know, it doesn't, you need to impress upon this uh, again and again and reflect on it. It's, it's from uh, Mahatma Gandhi, the air, the earth, the land, and the water are not an inheritance from our forefathers, but on loan from our children. So we have to hand over to them at least as it was handed over to us. And so can we do that? Thank you. Thank you, Jaya. Well, uh, listeners, I must say that we both are guilty of having stepped a little over time. It's 6.32. It's time that I handed over the mic to, uh, to uh, Vikas for a lovely presentation that I will learn from too. But before that, let me acknowledge the presence of some wonderful leaders out here. There is Manikandan of IHF. There is Lumi Engineer, who's been one of the green champions for the last 25 years. There is Leela Prasad, who is another IGBC champion of many years, who is present here. V. Suresh, the chairman of IGBC, was very keen on being uh, you know, present at this session, but uh, has had another session which has spilled over time as usual. But I think he will join us too soon enough. We've got Vivek Sabarwal, we've got Niranjan Khatri, who's going to be presenting in this same iconic innovation series, uh, you know, in the, in the next uh, couple of editions. There is Ashok Natkarni from MISO, a wonderful structural rehab man. I will have to see how he is persuaded to come and make a presentation sometime to all our students. Basan Kini, who is a CEO, but a person who has been curious and wanting to know. Professor Rava Subramaniam, Professor Sri Lakshmi, thank you so much, uh, Professor Sri Lakshmi, for being here today and having all the wonderful students of yours from the Sri Sri University in Qatar present here. There is also Ashok Mandansa from Mangalore. Uh, from the BITS uh, College out there, many, many others uh, who, are, who are present today. Uh, although I'd like to think that if those of you who came in late and those of you who couldn't uh, attend this and you will possibly spread the word, must take the look at the recording, uh, which will be hosted on this website tomorrow sometime, premjainmemorialtrust.com. Once again, premjainmemorialtrust.com. Check that out tomorrow. Tell your friends to watch this unique series and this unique presentation from Vikas Drummauer. Um, over to you, Vikas. We're looking forward to this one. But we have to set the stone. You understand why? This mental barrier, this business of mental engineering, and not such just conventional material engineering, is what the world needs before us. Go ahead, Vikas. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hari. Uh, Dr. Hari, you have been an inspiration to us. Your work uh, ahead of time between 2007 and 2008 gave us an inspiration to start working on uh, recycling. Thank you for being a mentor. And uh, Jaya, what can I say? Because of uh, Jaya, we got introduced to great mentors like Dr. Hariharan, uh, uh, Naga Prakasham, sir. So we, have, we got great mentors to work on this uh, 
responsibility of uh, saving water so thank you jaya aarti monica all the team from wri for get giving us a platform to uh, grow grow forward in terms of uh, becoming aware of socially responsible uh, sustainability aspects in water thank you jaya and dr dr harian and thank you prem jain memorial trust uh, thank you debashis debarti uh, payal all of you to have conducted these amazing seminars i have been listening to all the webinars it has been amazing and uh, thank you for doing this uh, bit for the society so uh, the topic given to me now uh, which i am very interested to talk about is should fresh water be used only once the answer to this is the key in designing iconic buildings in iconic cities so i used to live in london before coming to india in 2008 so i used to live in london so because can you put this on the view more please yeah. yeah thank you so i used to live in london uh, before moving to india in 2008 for the past 12 years i have been working on water when i was in london i uh, i was fortunate enough to work uh, walking distance from the tower bridge so during lunch break we used to go out for lunch and i used to grab a sandwich or a baguette and sit in the banks of river thames and have the sandwich and i wondered not even one day we had smell coming out of the thames river and this kept on whenever i come back on a vacation to india every lake every river it's always contaminated so this went on for years and suddenly i became patriotic and decided to move back to our country in 2008 from 2008 we have been working on water and water recycling so when cities like these do recycling so what immediately comes to the mind is what is israel doing what is singapore doing so i have lots of friends who say um, i would like to hear uh, in q and a session saying how many of you have been to singapore so if you have been to singapore you normally when you stay there for 3 days the statistic says it is highly likely that you have uh, drank recycled water there is more than 75% chance that you have uh, drank recycled water you should be proud of it so if people saying yes i have gone to singapore you should proud you should be proud that you have had no mental barriers in drinking water in singapore now i'd like to bring to your notice uh, that uh, israel if you see there it gets only 74 mm of rainfall every year and whereas singapore gets 2000 and odd mm of rainfall per year so when cities plan their water management they don't plan on what is falling into the city as rain for example in our country uh, we see the level of the dams which is getting filled and all our water management is planned based on what is falling into the city whereas these cities have water management plan based on what is going out of the city the city has a desired population and for that population what is the predictable volume of water which is going out of the city and the water management is planned based on what is going out of the city and whatever comes in is a bonus this happens irrespective of rainfall so in our we end up praying to rain gods just before the rainy season to get enough water and we uh, take the water which is meant for uh, the river belt to the cities so now all these cities when we see how they have done the water management model all of us we take from infrastructure which was left to us uh, before us so if you say we have bore wells now that comes from wells that still come from step wells which was there many many years ago and we have good sanitary lines planning all based on sanitary we have seen that in indus valley civilization many years ago and these shad off methods where uh, a vertical shaft is used to pull water from the bore well all these are inspirations for people engineers over time to design systems Uh, we used to have something called carriers method where where a uh, water aquifer used to be tapped and uh, water used to be distributed using canals in middle east they still have canals running for hundreds of kilometers and if a building wanted uh, air cold air to the building they used to pass hot air through these tunnels and take it to the building so we draw inspiration from all these uh, innovations however the innovation since 1920s has been so enormous and we stopped thinking on uh, aspects which were left to us before for example how many of you would have seen uh, uh, bwssb or pumping stations we now have lots of pumping stations pumping water from the rivers to the cities for example this top uh, picture is from bwssb pumping station one of the stations where we are pumping water 
in large volumes to the cities so we have pumps to pump to anywhere but one aspect which we are looking uh, not looking is the aspect of why should we pump when we have water in house recently there was an installation which was uh, 40 lakh liters of water pumping per hour imagine the amount of power which was which is spent in terms of pumping water so uh, now uh, dr hariharan uh, always says the market demand has to derive the business in terms of need so this um, chart is from pwc price water scooper report in 2017 on the water cost in different uh, cities of india so uh, if you see in bangalore we get around 90 rupees per kl which is 9 paisa per liter this water cost is an average water cost of the population which is a mix of municipal water supply together with tanker and borewell water supply delhi used to have 14.6 paisa per liter they pay so this demand in terms of water if you see the government when they supply they subsidize the cost which is when they send the water so for example if we take cover it cost them 80 and odd paisa per liter to actually send the water lift the water from the river however we have pre allocated budget which is written off every year we still have to give a subsidized cost for people using water so this is the same situation in most of the cities it is subsidized cost of water municipal water otherwise we take it from borewell then we always know the different costs of water so in bangalore city we get between 4 and 8 paisa of uh, municipal water supply and goes up to 25 22 paisa this first uh, image is the municipal water supply and uh, during uh, during summer we all know about the tanker water issues which we get it has been sold between 10 and 38 paisa last year we it went to almost 50 paisa per liter in terms of tanker water and we have borewell water which is costing between 1 and 4 paisa per liter and uh, we all know about bottled water 10 to 30 rupees per liter so now i'll come to bangalore as a case study because this is the area which i work and uh, currently trying to create impact so um, with bangalore municipal water supply we currently get 140 crore liter of water per day pumped by 65 substations i showed you a picture of substation before we use 65 of them to pump water 100 kilometers away from a river to the city if you if you take now this is one large source of water we have 120 to 160 crore we have lots of leakages in the water supply uh, apart from that we have tanker water supplying water to uh, to meet the city's demand now let us take the other side of the coin like what other cities do in terms of waste water we send every day out from our building from our apartment every day we send close to 200 crore liter of water per day so with the small math varathur lake in bangalore is equal to 15 lakh meter cube so every month we will be pumping out treated waste water equal to 13 lakhs we'll be able to build 13 lakhs with this water which is coming out every month out of the city of bangalore so this is the enormous volume of water which is completely untapped and whenever there is a water problem we look at extending uh, river projects where we draw more water from the river and depriving people of uh, the region the belt where the, they need water in terms of municipal supply so let's coming let's come to the current situation current scenario on water management which happens in our uh, country so say you live in an apartment complex uh, with say 400 people or you live in a it park be it an industry we get borewell water or tanker so if, when i say borewell water tanker guys also get either mostly from borewell water some get from river beds however this water gets supplied to our apartment and the water gets stored in the overhead tank we also get municipal water supply that also gets stored in the overhead tank as per government norms this water needs to be used and treated all the sewage waste water generated in the building needs to be treated any apartment complex about 20 units needs to have sewage treatment plant now as dr hariharan was saying uh, between 2000 and 2005 there has been lots of work on genome sciences and accidentally when they worked on microbiology stuff they found bacteria materials which can treat this waste water very efficiently so there are lots of innovation happening happening in waste water treatment segment now currently we have different technologies good technologies in in picture people use stp sewage treatment plant after sewage treatment plant we send it to the drain 
some use it for flushing and garden this is the current scenario we did a survey of uh, 200 apartments in bangalore who have sewage treatment plant predominantly most of them were using around 20 or 30% of stp treated water and rest was going to the drain that two people were using it to meet the government norms uh, saying that you have to use it for flushing they were using fresh water to mix and then you sending it for flushing and garden and predominantly majority of the water goes to the drain now this drain is what i'm saying 13 lakhs equivalent of water after spending one or two paisa per liter people still send it to the drain now what do other countries do they take this water process it through a unique health grade water producing system and then send it back to reuse right now this is the way forward for cities uh, to become sustainable now when i say health grade water i would like to bring a few water categories how how people categorize how government categorizes water or how pwc also categorizes water here you see stp secondary treated water which comes out of the stp goes through sand and carbon filtration now people living in apartment if you go to your basement and see your sewage treatment if you see two large cylinders those are generally sand and carbon filtration that produces grade one water so if you uh, have these kind of cylinder in the question and answer session you can put grade one water so this water grade one water is generally used for gardening and flushing and general area cleaning now the quality of grade one water entirely depends on the sewage treatment plant water and uh, it is of minimum use for garden and flushing now few people take this water do one more level of filtration which is either ultra filtration or micron filtration up to 5 or even up to 1 micron people filter water and produce grade 2 water grade 2 water can be used for low grade industrial uses and then we take further grade 2 water to a membrane based treatment process and produce grade 3 water now as as when whenever we see the word ro or we hear about reverse osmosis we have the feeling that for every liter of water 3 or 4 liters gets wasted when the when the purifier gets spoiled even up to 10 liters gets wasted what happens in domestic scale is true however in industrial scale we have even up to 90% recovery of the water so there are specialized systems available specialized membrane available to produce even 90% recovered water the grade 3 water is generally used for process water high quality process water for industrial usage now this grade 3 water is again passed through even more uh, treatment process called ultraviolet treatment to inactivate bacteria and pathogens this produces grade 4 water which technically is portable water for human consumption now after this process comes the health grade water so we produce even higher quality uh, to ensure safety for consumption now when grade 4 water is done then we do demineralization of water grade 5 water which is used for precision industry we have many industries where they want water which does not conduct electricity so this water can still be produced as a very high non conductive water for precision electronics now when i talk lots about technical people want to hear real stories so i would like to uh, say my uh, uh, work with malls so jaya had connected it, uh, connected us to zentio and we had planned meeting so whenever there is a mall so we like to go to malls to meet our friends do some shopping go for movies so a uh, few of us like to go to malls to have our me meetings conducted so this zentio call which i had with jaya connected i did it in uh, starbucks in one of the ma malls in bangalore after the meeting we have very good ambient temperature we enjoy the ambience and then we really enjoy the meeting conducted there we enjoy our friends being there but behind the scene there is a huge industry which is working so in this picture if you see on the top of the terrace there are few towers so these towers are called cooling towers the reason why the whole air condition is working is because of these cooling towers and these cooling towers consume lot of water to keep it running and to keep the customers to the mall happy in terms of ac right i had the meeting one a good meeting with zentio and then finally uh, i decided to go meet the mall management office uh, at the at the basement so 
when i went there i met the mall manager and during that time i saw a person carrying a big rice bag sort of big bag i inquired what he was carrying and uh, they said it was a bag of salt 50 kg bag of salt then i realized being in water industry they use this salt for water softening yeah and over many meetings i came to understand that that mall was using 14 tons of salt a month to soften water so i asked this manager so you are only softening the water to prevent scales uh, how about other contaminants in the water they said uh, we are using stp treated water and then passing it through softener and then sending it to cooling tower however we are only handling hardness all the other contaminants we are not handling so i said uh, do you realize that you are sending 14 tons of salt which is concentrated salt to the drain every month they said they realized that and uh, during that month they decided to discontinue water softener and then buy fresh water for cooling tower so then over many meetings we uh, asked why are they using fresh water they buying tanker at 15 16 paisa per liter and then sending it to the cooling tower why are they using fresh water and what are they doing with excess stp water which they currently are not sending it to the softener they said they have enough garden to use partially stp treated water still they have 1 lakh 50000 liters of water every day which comes out of the stp but it is being sent out most of the time because the garden area is consuming all the water so i went to the softener room i saw these big cylinders people were mixing huge tons tons and tons of salt not even one person was happy in terms of what they were doing and they are draining out salt eventually they moved to fresh water and over many meetings we made them realize that fresh water cannot be used for cooling tar when there is a method to convert stp treated water without all these ha hazards to a high quality water which can be used for cooling tar and over time they have agreed now we are very happy we are saving 1 lakh 50000 liters of water every day for this mall so i took statistics of uh, all the few of the projects which we have done one is an it park uh, we did they have 500 ton refrigeration after health grade water which they they reduce the cost almost 3 times 2 and a half times uh, reduction in cost together with huge volume of water saved every day 60000 liters of water one block in an it park is saving every day and it goes from 60000 to 1 lakh liters of water every day we have two other malls where we have done one mall is saving almost 35000 liters of water every day and the other mall is saving 80000 liters of water it's not just the water which they have saved commercially it has become very viable for them to opt for high quality water for their cooling tower without any headache for them to maintain large systems so these are few statistics uh, with water cooled chill chilling tower 600 tons uh, refrigeration was consuming 70 70 kg of water every day and they were buying fresh water between 7 and a half and 15 paisa per liter we are saving currently 50000 rupees per day for them for this small in terms of water and we are also saving 1 lakh 50000 liters of water so the embodied cost like labor transporting salt from one pondicherry to the location all these is not taken into consideration if you take all these there is a huge benefit in terms of water saving and the cost i believe all cooling towers should look at alternative methods to softening and uh, have their own sources of high quality water when they have borewell source tanker water source municipal water source they should have this high health grade water source within their facility so now whenever we talk about technologies used to produce health grade water there are too many technologies in action currently i will start with the special reverse osmosis membrane which does not waste heavy water you are able to recover 90% of water there is one thing which is very innovative and we are trying to use in use it in our product is forward osmosis see reverse osmosis requires high pressure and forward osmosis is osmotic pressure it uses to uh, remove salts from water so this diagram we have something called draw solution where we use for we can use forward osmosis membrane to recover water and the waste water is less than 5% we can recover even that with few more membranes there is one more technology which is coming up based on genome sciences which dr harian was saying they coat the membranes with carbon nanotubes and special kinds of materials so cnt is carbon nanotubes and graphene based material they coat it on the membrane process to improve the efficiency of membrane so this is a very uh, new innovation which is coming uh, into the market currently 
and there is one uh, thing which we are currently working on is pressure retard reverse osmosis and forward osmosis membrane which means that if your membrane is requiring 12 kg uh, if a membrane is requiring 12 kg 11.4 kg pressure you don't have to use a 12 kg pressure generating pump you can use a pump and use a pressure retard method to only use 11.4 kg pressure and use the remaining power back into the system so these are some of the innovations which are happening in terms of producing health grade water and apart from membrane treatment there are pre treatments which are available for uh, our projects we use aluminum silicate based media we use manganese dioxide these are natural materials which are available which are used in the pre treatment uh, before membrane so there are enormous work happening on these membrane based technologies our um, coming to market people try not uh, to be secure and use only the conventional stuffs which are available but our challenge uh, our uh, sustainability comes from these innovations which makes the technology viable for cities and countries like india so when i talk about technology there is also something called remote monitoring see when we produce very high quality water people want to know what is the quality of water real time so we have made sure that all our equipments which go people can can they get data every 10 minutes to their mobile they know what is the quantity of water they are getting what is the quality of water they are getting what is the quantity of water which they are using it for specific application so all these data becomes mandatory when advanced technologies are, are in place so we need to know what the quality and the quantity of water coming in each of our taps for in each of our applications so when i talk lots about technologies lots of my friends would generally say um uh, is water scarcity real we talk lot about technology is it just a hyped up thing where people keep saying that water scarcity is there is it a hyped up and not real so i have real time uh, since i moved back to india in 2008 till uh, till till date we have had lots of data we work with borewell drillers who drill um, boreholes into the into apartments into buildings in 2008 the average depth which they were giving in their report was between 200 and 300 feet was the average depth which they used to say and the tds which is total dissolved salts it's different from hardness total dissolved salts in the water is between 4 450 and 500 ppm in 2008 this is the average i'm saying even at that time it was like 800 and few places now over time 2019 the we don't see any borewell depth of 200 300 we see anything above 800 average is about 800 850 1000 100 1200 so we should learn one thing that we are taking water at a very fast pace compared to what we get as rain and the quality of water as we go depth deteriorates in most cases in most cases it is about 1200 ppm as tds in anekal few regions in bangalore we have 4600 ppm as total dissolved salts now these parameters help us understand the real scarcity being the being in the industry now coming to the government government spends 50000 rupees per acre to have data for surface water if you have river if you have rain it is all accessible government spends 50000 per acre do you know how much we spend for borewell and assessing what is available zero we don't have mechanism to analyze how many bores are there analyze how much quantity of borewell water is there the government doesn't know what is there below our ground ground it is international bodies who say 2022 few cities will go out of water 2025 few people say but as our government we don't know what is there below our ground right now coming to treatment of water when we produce health grade water so i remember a story which when i was young i was in bramaver we used to have lots of mango trees uh, there so we as kids go take all the mangoes which has fallen we take and come and we each of us choose one mango which is very good it doesn't have any black spots we choose the one which is very good and the rest we used to discard our grandmother used to say you cannot discard discard a mango which is 1% spoiled you have a tool called knife you cut it and you can use the remaining mango and it did not look logical even from their perspective to throw away something which is 98% good and 2% bad so there are tools to remove bad uh, particles so now when we buy mangoes in numbers 
uh, when we buy order from big basket we get five mangoes we don't throw if five mangoes if we, if there is one spot in one of the mango we cut that portion and use the remaining mango so because it's logical to do that right so now if we take waste water it's exactly same scenario so uh, dr hariharan had shared some reference reading and all the data in a waste water it is 99% good water only 1% or even less than 1% is organic and salt and other nutrients nutrient contamination then why do we throw the entire 100 liter 100% of water out without any uh, reuse purpose if we drill down further organic matter is the easiest thing to remove and there are salts which requires membranes to remove there are nutrients which are require special pre treatments to remove this so i would like to ask you yourself one question how ah, is it logical to throw away 100% of water when only 1% is contaminated contaminated i understand visibly it looks the water looks dirty visibly it looks dirty but technically it is just 1% which is contaminating the 100% of water and there are technologies which are available to recover huge quantity of water from the waste water so i would like to bring to the point now few people say i uh, i would rather prefer tanker water or borewell water towards health grade water so i'd like to since there are lots of students also in this i would like to uh, explain on few of the parameters from the water report which is available from nabl certified laboratory this is one of the borewell water report which we have taken recently if you see uh, there are many parameters turbidity ph total dissolved salts hardness and many other parameters in this uh, slide if you see the total dissolved salts is 667 ppm so when you have kent or aqua guard guys come water purifier guys coming to your house and dipping a meter inside the water and telling you some value that is the total dissolved salts in the water it is not the hardness of the water it is total dissolved salts it is all the salts together what is the conductivity of the water and that gives you total dissolved salts in the water now hardness is 141 this will still leave scales is only the presence of calcium carbonate this is measured using a chemical kit so now these are the parameters if you see chloride these are the parameters generally in a borewell water now there are other parameters in the borewell water one microbial contamination if you see e coli the government themselves say 70% 65 to 70% of all borewell waters which are available in cities in bangalore at least is contaminated with e coli and total coliforms there is heavy contamination in terms of in terms of bacterial contamination as well so previously in bangalore we used to have many one large aquifer where we can ascertain the quality of water predominantly in most of the region now we have dug so deep and our aquifers are so divided that 100 meters down the line there is a different borewell and there is different kind of water different contamination there can be sewage line going near which seeps into the borewell so we really don't know what is Uh, coming so predominantly all the reports which we see of tanker or borewell water have either total coliforms e coli and uh, high level of salts in it now coming to health grade water so if you see i have taken the worst possible health grade water which can be uh, used the total dissolved solids which we get is only 98 whereas in the other water we had 600 not the total dissolved salts which includes all the minerals together that it says only 98 now other parameters if, if we go to hardness it's only 9 ppm of hardness scale free water so if you see these parameters all the parameters in terms of chemicals chlorides all these levels are acceptable levels for drinking water this is as per is 10500 standards and it is laboratory report together with real time data which we have on these reports so if you see phenolic compounds chloramine all these parameters which generally don't get tested needs technically to be tested for even borewell tanker because all these are not known for example nitrate in the water in basveshwar nagar in 2008 we had 40 45 between 30 and 45 ppm of nitrate so now we have 400 odd ppm of nitrate if you take one bottle of water you will still look the water still looks clear but it has heavy contamination of nitrate if you don't get it tested you don't know so we have to be aware of what water we use if you see the bacterial contamination in terms of health grade water it is absent it is not detected in any 100 ml sample which was taken so there is no uh, heavy metal contamination no toxic substance in the health grade water right now uh, we don't want to be the first people to try something new in terms of recycling right 
So I have few data which Dr. Harir and Jaya, all of them have told before. I have some data, little technicals as well. So um, Windock in Namibia, they have been using recycled water for the past 50 years. So when we, when we say recycled water, there are two norms which is currently not in India, but internationally it is available, which is called DPR, direct portable reuse, which means after your health grade water production, you directly send it to your sum or distribution system. That is direct portable reuse and Namibia has been doing it for past 50 years. California, uh, two years ago, it was emergency. It was on DPR. They switched between DPR and IPR. IPR is indirect portable reuse where they take it to a natural reservoir and then take it to the sump to, to avoid the mine block. Those are called indirect portable reuse. In Texas, they do, we all know about Israel. They do both DPR and IPR. In Texas, they do DPR and IPR. Now, in 2008, Singapore's head of Singapore called lots of people to a stadium and all of them drank recycled water. Their dependency on import is heavy, so they became sustainable and they have a very great plan for 2030 in terms of becoming sustainable in terms of uh, water. Now, not just Singapore, now China. China uses 60% of all their water's reclaimed water. And as Dr. said, between 2014 and now they have progressed so fast in terms of recycled water which makes us think they have all data of water available and they have taken that steps in terms of becoming sustainable. Why are we left out is one question which keeps on uh, coming to my mind. I believe awareness is the key thing and mindset is the key thing. The way forward for IT parks, malls, apartment is to take their STP treated water and produce health grade water and then this system needs to be left to the professionals to handle and the customer just pays for the water which, he, which, which they use. In a building design, they have to look at health grade water production in all their designs. Now, I'll come to the most important barrier which we generally face is the mindset barrier. When we were kids, when we see people, kids enjoying in a water fountain in a water, we first think of the kid enjoying in water and we feel happy about it. This used to be 15, 20 years ago. We used to feel that we used to see the kids enjoyment. Now, now whenever we see a kid playing in water, we immediately go and switch off the tap or we have that scarcity mindset, which has gone into us. We are in that scarcity mindset. So I believe to solve water scarcity, we should come out of the scarcity mindset. This is one important mindset change, which we as individuals need to look at. Now coming to commercial angle in terms of apartment complexes, industries, I would like to give an example of say uh, there is an apartment with 800 families in it. They buy about four lakh liters of water every single day and predominantly it's tanker water which they buy. Now the association members sit and decide they have to bring awareness inside their apartment. And the few of them have the intention that there are lots of people who are using lots of water. So I, I believe that people intentionally don't waste water. It is not intentional for people to wantedly waste water, but they are not aware on how much is being used. Okay. So the association sits together during one of their agents and decides we will put water meter and find the culprit who is using lots of water. We are going to find that. So uh, out of 800 families, they do a huge investment and put meters everywhere with the intention of finding the culprit. Finally, what happens? 30 people are using more water than they are supposed to use. 25 people are not aware that they were using water. They have reduced their water consumption. And predominantly, people who used more water have now legally saying that they will pay more water, pay more money to use more water. So the intention from saving water has gone to finding people who are culprits. So the intention, what I believe the mindset needs to change is these meters technologies has to help leakages, has to help the right intention of solving water crisis. The apartment association have to go for meters to monitor the leakages and not to find thief within the apartment and not make uh, people who are using more water pay more money. This is not the mindset that we uh, wish to grow. Say the apartment sits together and decides we are buying four lakh liters. Let's look at advanced technologies and reduce the water usage 
all of them pull in and then decide to recover 3 lakh liters of water which is currently going out as waste and buying only 1 lakh liters outside so recovering majority of the water back for their usage i believe this is the mindset people have to look at long term solution for apartment complexes it parks individual layouts the mindset has to be to create abundance of water not to create the fear of scarcity so i would like to close my meeting uh, close my talk on this i believe the only way forward for city is to sustain in terms of water is recycling i want each one of you to look at this mindset of creating abundance of water within our cities and move towards positive uh, positive in water thank you very much uh, all of you for patiently listening to this webinar thank you very much thank you vikas for providing that vista that tour jaya says 70% of water in in bangalore and the uh, it's not an exception i can say i can tell you that it is so in ncr it is so in bombay in every city in india 70% of water is unfit to drink and uh, our man is telling us vikas is telling us that no more than 0.1% of waste water from your apartment from your office from any such building has organic matter and it can easily be treated i would any day put my bet on a treatment system in the backyard of my apartment or my office than water from municipal grid where i don't know what they do to treat and this is what i think you should all remember he says and you all know that if you had real time quality monitoring of water on your smartphone every 10 minutes it's far better than to have municipal water whether it's from ganga or from yamuna or from kaveri here or from some of those rivers that bombay gets it from when you buy borewell water what he was talking about was solid tds but hardness in bangalore in many places where they get tanker water is over 2300 sometimes 2500 and potable water as you saw in the parameters that he showed you should be less than 150 140 in the water that can be treated with these solutions that vikas is talking about you get less than 100 as hardness and that is the future clearly many of you here are experts who are professionals who are guiding clients who are building apartments or running apartments or running malls and such as such other spaces you can't use fresh water only once Well, thank you once again, Vikas. And some questions for you all. I will start with one question from Peter Kasaija from the University of Makerere in uh, Uganda, Kampala. His question to you is Jaya. Uh, to you, Jaya. An interesting figure Jaya gives us on our water is that about if, for every one liter of water generated, about fifteen liters are lost in the process. How has it come to this? Can you can you? tell us what that means another concern is about the issue jaya has raised as one of the responses to the water challenge that enforcing norms quote and quote can be exploited towards realizing positive behavioral change would you want to uh, respond to that uh, jaya sure uh, thanks sir i'll start with the first one it's actually 3 liters of water uh, for i mean you get 3 liters out of wasting 15 liters how it came to that is uh, if you know the aro story um the person who started that basically his son uh, was diagnosed with jaundice um, i believe and or, or i think it was typhoid sorry and and basically you know they were uh, he was basically really frustrated with the quality of the water that was available and he brought you know aro to life and and that's how it came up and then before we knew it uh, it had such an important uh, and it had such basically nice a uh, branding and you know they basically got film stars and you know important people to promote it as you know something that is essential in every home uh, in a way that now all of us are drinking out of our homes right so uh, that's how it happened and and you know how it got to that you know this is what i was talking about is the negative unintended negative consequences or the externalities and part of this was that because ro the way it was the water was produced was not regulated and this is also partially answering your second question because of government's lack of involvement in this whole process uh you know this negative externality was ignored 
and therefore it continues to persist now. And that's how norms and standards are actually very important. Uh, and when you're talking about, you know, enforcement of norms and standards versus behavior change, I think both of those need to really happen hand in hand. You need to have norms and standards because the government needs to kind of bring that into the picture, especially as it relates to recycled water and we have none. Um, and, you know, and the, in the meantime, uh, there is, you know, fresh water being used for chillers, power plants, you know, can they not use recycled water? You know, can we restrict Absolutely. fresh water use by certain sectors? And that's where that norm yeah. seems to, where the norm seems to come in. And then the behavior change is a separate story because I think you need to be aware of how much you're consuming, aware of the social costs involved with the water extraction because there are direct costs, capex, ONM, there are indirect, the time for collecting groundwater extraction, there are climate costs, the emissions that come from the energy used to pump, there are health costs, you know, associated with contamination. And I think all of those need to be brought in front of people's faces so that they need to think about, do I really need 135 liters per day per person? Um, and, and just to bring that, thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me now acknowledge the, uh, the distinguished presence of the chairman of the Indian Green Building Council, uh, Sri Mee Suresh, is here with us today. Um, he joined in a little late because he had a critical meeting with the uh, ECBC and the, and the minister. Uh, he writes, and this is good news for you, uh, uh, Vikas, he says that he will invite you for a meeting with the minister, uh, Shekhawath, of the, uh, of, uh, on the Jal Shakti program. And uh, he says that, uh, though he missed the initial contextual presentation of Jaya and mine, that, uh, uh, you know, that he will see, that he can see that it's about a combination of awareness, appreciation, and application. Clearly, he sees this to be the way forward. And there's another person called Padu Padmanabhan. Let me acknowledge his presence also. He's all there, always there in such meetings. He's a champion of energy for the last 50 years nearly. Um, uh, thank you, Jaya, for welcoming Peter. And, uh, you know, he says most often case examples are missing, you know, in, in presentations such as this one. Uh, I, well, because you, do you want to say anything about those case examples? I know you have done uh, well, two IT parks and a mall and a couple of residential spaces. I know you're doing about 10 or 11 residential apartments. There's Murli Anur here, another wonderful champion for green uh, causes and values and, uh, and uh, benefits. Uh, people like you are working on such possibilities. Can you tell us about what you see, therefore, as uh, the market uh, prospect and the market challenge, Vikas? Yeah, so uh, in terms of market prospects for industrial use, like cooling towers, for all the IT parks, industrial use, it gets um, adopted faster. There is no mind block in terms of using the water. But when it comes to residential, you, uh, residential there is a huge mind block. Uh, there are people saying that we don't even want to use STP treated water in our garden because there is Tulsi planted in my garden. So I don't want to use even STP treated water for gardening. So that level of mind block exists in predominantly many communities. So I see uh, to answer your two questions, what mindset is the issue in domestic application and commercial application. The duration of closures, these are large IT parks, most the, the uh, length of closures is generally a long cycle because they have to allocate space, they have to get uh, fire. Despite, despite all that, you, have, you are now doing about 10, 12 apartments, you know. Yes. And uh, so that change, if let's say you complete those, and I think the delay has only been, as you told me privately earlier on, uh, has been thanks to post, uh, the, the COVID challenges of execution and such. So over the next say, three to five months, if you saw some, some of these apartments converting themselves and overcoming that behavior and challenge, do you see a, a larger prospect coming across? Yes, there is a huge potential. Just Bangalore can save 13 lakes every month. So the potential is so huge. And we, uh, we can create water abundance within cities and uh, this should be the model for cities. I see a huge potential in terms of um, uh, water. You know, let me add uh, that Kampala is a city about the size of Mysore. Their requirement I saw some months ago is about 500 million liters. You know their unfortunate challenge? They are right there on nearly the banks of the second largest lake in the world, Lake Victoria. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you land in Kampala, you're landing on the very edge of that lake. And then you drive into the city, you hear of the challenges of the kind that Jaya spoke about. The challenge is not for us in the middle class in the next five years. The challenge is for that every third citizen in the city, in whatever city you are, of 
the slum dweller, what we call the slum dweller. Shahrukh Mistri, another architect who's not present here today, says, why are we calling them slums? Let's call them informal settlements. But beyond the, you know, the nuance of the terminologies that we use, Jaya, if you see that challenge of slums being the biggest victim, as COVID has also shown in its ways on the vulnerability of that set of people, what do you see they can do as an articulate and a, and a vocal voice into the future? So, uh, Hari, yes. So I think one of the things that we need to acknowledge first off is that, you know, if we depend on just groundwater, we will never be water secure. No country can ever be water secure if you just mm -hmm. depend on groundwater sources. Right. And, you know, there are different policies that states have adopted. I mean, firstly, many states uh, do not face physical scarcity of water, right? You know, they actually have floods for the most part. Um, and also our, half, you know, our harvesting, uh, water harvesting techniques are either non-existent or are very primitive or are not used. And so we don't know how to harvest all this water that we are getting. Again, as you see, you know, and I think Vikas had pointed this out, we don't have an Israel-like situation. You know, we have plenty of monsoons and we get good water. Um, so part of it is, you know, how do you harvest it? And then the part of it is, you know, what certain state governments have done because water is a state subject about, you know, treating it as, as doles, you know. So the whole dole economics of giving free water or not giving free water and making that, you know, uh, a political... Populist promise. Yeah. And, I, and so I think one of the things for slums, I think, is that, you know, water is a basic human right, yes, and it needs to be free, but for the right people. If I can pay for it, why should I not pay for it? And right. if a slum dweller can't, why should they, you know, why can't they get it at a subsidized rate? Also, what the government needs to do is look at expanding their infrastructure so that everyone's getting pipe supply, especially with this whole disease and the pandemic and several others, you know, that are to come. Right. Can the whole piped infrastructure be expanded at the cost of people who can pay for it? And can the slum dwellers then, once it's in place, pay, you know, pay the subsidized cost, which I'm sure they would be happy to pay versus the prices now that they pay for tanker water? Yeah. Well, it's a large issue and you know, lots of challenges there. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen out there, lots of questions. I, I, I take a few of them. Many of you, uh, heartening it is to me, uh, our students, uh, many of you have addressed questions for Vikas. I'll only say that we will take every one of these questions, ask Vikas and Jaya as experts, and to the, to, to the extent that I can, we will respond to those uh, questions and put them up uh, in, the, in the section at the PenjainMemorialTrust.com by Monday or Tuesday, sometime when we have time to do this. Uh, but some questions here, Mimin Sete says, in the USA, the codes don't allow the use of treated STP flushing allowed only for subsoil and not regular irrigation. I'm not asking anyone to answer that question, but I'm reading this in order that all of you out there as listeners think about that. How much water is recycled in Indian industry? How much is recycled in cities? Other people wants to know. I think the figure is less than 8 to 11% in a city like Bangalore. Somebody else is also not asking another question on how HGW can be used as a treatment system before we let water into lakes. Dear friend, do not use HGW for treating and letting into lakes. Drink the water. It's far superior in terms of quality of water to anything that you can get as sources of water today anywhere in the world. I'm being as emphatic and didactic about it because I can tell you that by my own experience, I did this, I think, in 2011 or 2010 or some such thing in another apartment in Whitefield in Bangalore to the east of Bangalore. And I can tell you that people drink it. They're extremely happy. Nobody died. The, the Pollution Control Board chairman came on those days. He took this glass of water and as uh, uh, the rest of us stood there, he said, if I, if I uh, drink this water, he was kidding. If I drink this water, you think I'll wake up tomorrow morning? Now, the change in the last eight years has been phenomenal. So don't even think of shelf grade water as something that you will do and dispose of. This is water that you can drink. Well, STPs have to be set up. As Padhu Padmanabh was saying, we need STPs to be set up before we let water into our lakes. There's only one lake in Bangalore. And I hear that there is one such lake in Surat, which has secured a system. The system has failed. We can't blame the government for it. We need to see how we can work on it. And people like Suresh Saab have been working tirelessly, without fatiguing, on how we can get some change from the government. I can tell you the present disposition, apart from ideologies and such, are people who are earnest who want to see the change. 
Hello, Prasanna Kumar. Thank you for being here. He's the president of the IPA, uh, Chatham Bangalore, and has been a very influential person when it comes to order. His question, or well, it's an observation. It's time for government to set new norms of compulsory meeting. Well, Prasanna Kumar, I must say that there is today mandated flow meter installations to be done for any building uh, which has more than three flats. You know, so the law exists, but the government cannot, you know, uh, regulate this. They cannot police this. They cannot monitor this because defaults in a country like ours is about, and in Africa, is about how you get away if you're not caught. So many people are either use speed money or they just don't do it. It's a question of that mental mindset change or what I call mental engineering to be done. Most developers, for example, as uh, Prasanna Kumar is saying, are always you know, penny foolish, penny wise and pound foolish. The cost per square foot they look at. There are three or four questions on this. I'm not taking their names if you don't mind. But the question of investment in the kind of systems that Vikas is talking about is like this. I can tell you that a, that a 100,000 liter system, let's say 100 KL per day kind of system, whatever be the investment, let's not discuss the cost today, can be recovered in less than about 40 months with a return on investment of over 22 to 24%, staggering returns. You cannot get more than six to 7% if you were to put your money in a fixed deposit in a bank. And here is four times, three times, three and a half times that money that you can get as a return. So why are people not doing it? And why can't people understand that this is now the norm in China, in urban China? And, and of course, in Singapore, as we know, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur has done this already, quietly. They didn't even have to talk about it. People accept it. The difference is that in India, we should not look at a centralized process. Pipe systems are fine for certain areas, as Jaya says. But then when it comes to your apartments, to your offices, there are technology parks which use 14 million liters per day. What can they do to see that they put this in a zero loop? That is a true shift that we need beyond what we do, certification of green buildings. Another question, why India is not investing in industries to manage the resources and investing in old conventional ways, which is no good to us. As from Tarunia saying, I have myself answered that question. Well, there is an effort uh, with the MSMH. For instance, there is the EESL, a super escrow in India, which is turning to how they can bring such shifts in behavior as well as in technology solutions. solutions. Uh, for for uh, industry sector, large and small. Uh, because, one more question to you, Apurva Shah. Present sewage treatment methods activated sludge process is ineffective in removing pathogen and creates epidemic infections. Kindly talk about scientific principles of technology uh, technologies you advocate to reuse water. Apurva, I will say that we will do this offline. I will ask him to come back to you on this one. Uh, Peter Kasaija again asks, do you have any credible figures, Vikas? Estimations about how much water is used to flush and heat human excreta sewage in centralized systems. Do you have any credible figures? Because yeah, uh, it is uh, as per per capita is 33 liters for flushing. Right. And uh, there's two liters, three liters for drinking, five liters for other purpose, and total per capita is 135. So for flushing, it right, is 30, right. 33 liters. Right. Okay. Sukumar so Rao, the sketch has not remained exclusive problem of cities, even in tier two towns. Well, I'll tell you that of the 7,900 cities and towns to come out in India, almost 600 cities, which have population of over 100,000, have the same challenge. You can go to Gokak in Karnataka, you can go to Gura in Madhya Pradesh, you have the same challenge. Indore, which has river, a water source uh, with Nanda being its source, ABB funded something about 15 years ago, I think. Again, the challenge is, you cannot go with long distance source, not in India. You cannot go with centralized treatment systems, not in India. You have to look at localized solutions because the nature of that beast called government is so different in India, unlike in China or in Singapore. I, I'd like you to remember that. All of you youngsters, please know that, you know, there's one person asking this question. As a student, what can I do from the World University uh, in Delhi? My, my suggestion to you all is this. What can you do is, if you're an architect, for example, understand more of things that are beyond the envelope. Do not just uh, learning on aesthetics and volume and space. Go away from the traditional uh, architectural uh, 
process and approach to, to, to our clients, tell them about what it means in terms of all those elements that plug into a building and plug out of a building. Buildings are living, they are living buildings. And you have to understand that they live far, far longer than you and I do. Every single element in, in a building lives perhaps a million years because they're taken from earth. And so I, 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 my urge to all of your students is that you get to, to understanding this in a way that you become future ready, in a way that you are market ready, in a way that you are industry relevant. Because if you are an architect wanting to persuade or influence the decision for a client, he needs to understand the impact on the building beyond a building that looks pretty. Um, you, uh, somebody else's Janak Dastari says to you, because you have not mentioned biotechnology methodology, it is possible to produce variable water without electricity. Do you want to say something about that? Uh, I missed it. Uh, it is possible. Is it possible to produce portable water without electricity, energy free? So it can be less energy. Uh, all components, all technologies currently need energy to work, but Innovations in energy have come. It can be less energy, but no, uh, not right. zero. I got that. Uh, Shashank uh, from uh, uh, Shashank Amali wants to know, is there any community enabled method for water recycling for people who are underprivileged? Jaya? Uh, I, Right now, and I think, Hari, actually, you're uh, the right person to answer this question. But right <laughs> now, uh, yeah, right now, I mean, you know this really well. Right yeah. now, for the underprivileged, we don't, you know. Well, um, I, yeah, let me add to what there, Jay, sorry. And yeah. there are certain innovations that I would like to mention that we yeah. saw through our City Fix labs, you know, where they were talking about using water recycling and creating pods for wash. Mm -hmm. So not just water, but also sanitation. Mm -hmm. But there are very few and the uptake is not there. Right. Uh, yeah, I get that. Uh, let me also to share with you all that we're looking at some 10 slums in Bangalore of about 200 houses and 800 to 900 people to each slum. Uh, I'll call it a slum, though that's a word that you and I are born. Uh, uh, and uh, we're looking at how we'll put in the zero discharge loop there. Uh, Vikas will be partnering this process for us. Uh, if you have 800 people, and if I were to take the same 150 or 135 as in you all know your math enough to know how we can make that water loop. If you go to a slum, like Jaya said, and stand in front of it the day or, or the morning, a tanker comes in there. You must see the mess. And it's really sordid. I was there four, five days ago at one of these slums, uh, you know, in the heart of the city. And I saw people bringing in two buckets or two uh, pots or some such thing, plastic ones. And they did not get enough water from the tanker. A lot of it spilled out there on the ground. And the cost that they pay for that tanker is way more. Though they, you know, they, they have some system where the money is first paid to the tanker guy and each of them shares it. This is the pathetic situation that we have. And, and you know, that's a major takeaway from what Jaya said. You and I, as in, in the middle class or the upper classes and the richer classes will not suffer. It is these, this other one third of Bangalore or one third of Bombay or Delhi or whatever will suffer a lot more if we don't know how to bring in such localized solutions of the kind that uh, this means. Fresh water cannot ever be used only once. It's sinful to do that. I'll stop there, it's 7.32. We are way beyond the time sets that we set. Thank you so much. Nearly all participants are still there. I appreciate the fact that you listen to this. A lot of you have come in with a lot of positive uh, responses to, uh, to, to uh, uh, what Vikas presented. Thank you, Suresh, sir, for saying that you will do what you can to have this voice heeded, heard, you know, uh, in, the, in the government. I think change can come if, if such, such uh, voices are heard uh, in, in circles where a larger impact can get made. Thank you so much to all of you for being here once again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let's call a close up today. My thanks go to the back end professional, all of them there, Devashish, Devarati. Uh, Tanya, Pyle Jane, of course, Mrs. Renu Jane. Mrs. Renu Jane, this must have been a moment that will help you remind you of your husband and all that he fought for. Uh, I am sure that we will carry the spirit at the Plain Jane Memorial Trust and see what we can do to make this country back again to be the Jagat Guru of sustainability. Thank you once again, all of you. Thank you, Jaya, for staying on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Vikas. you, Hari. Thank you, Vikas. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Grateful Thank to you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.